Hello, today we're going to talk about speciation and how species evolve. Okay? First of all, what is a species? A species is defined as a group of, of organisms that can interbreed with one another and live in the same area. The big part of that is that they can interbreed. They can produce fertile, viable offspring. So what makes a species? How do they evolve? Well, first of all, they have to become reproductively, reproductively isolated from one another. That means that even if they tried, that they can't produce babies. Okay, so let's look at an example. Um, there's a Baltimore Oreo and there's a Western Bullock Oreo. The two Oreos live in different areas. One lives on the western side of the Rocky Mountains, one lives on the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains, and they're separated by the Rockies. Because of that physical barrier, they can't breed with one another. Okay, It's a physical barrier. However, if you took the two of them and put them together in a cage and said, okay, they can't breed with one another because physically they have become so genetically different from one another they can no longer breed and make offspring even if they try so then they are considered two different species well those incompatibilities really evolve from mutations that have occurred differences that result in one group of Oreos, they've got certain mutations. The other group have different mutations. Sometimes those can be um, physical mutations, like differences in their DNA. Um, other times it can be behavioral differences, but it doesn't really matter. Those incompatibilities result in them not being able to breed. Now, sometimes what happens is on a sperm and egg, on the sperm head, there's some receptors that have to perfectly match the egg receptors. As mutations occur, sometimes mutations occur in those receptors, and so that an egg will not allow a sperm from that one that has a different <clears throat> difference to enter the egg, and so it won't fertilize the egg. That causes them to become different species. If the sperm can't fertilize the egg, they become very different they become reproductively isolated. So there are several barriers to reproduction, and we're going to go through several of them. Some occur before the sperm and egg unite, and some occur after the sperm and egg unite. Okay, But in either case, because there are these barriers, it leads to divergent divergence, where the one species starts to become more and more different, ultimately leading to speciation, which is the development of new species. So the first one is called prezygotic because pre means before the zygote. So these are the things that are happen before the egg fertilizes the egg. The first one would be habitat isolation. If you've got two species that live in different habitats, they aren't going to meet and they aren't going to breed. Okay, They're separated by physical habitat. If you've got one frog, for example, that lives in swamps and one frog <clears throat> that only lives in conifer forests, they don't come across each other, so they're rarely going to meet. They're not going to breed. Okay, that's a habitat isolation. Second one is a behavioral isolation, where mating courtship behaviors don't match up, and so the female is going to not pay any attention to that particular male, and so they aren't going to mate. Okay? Sometimes what happens is as divergence occurs, as they start to become more and more different from each other, some of the males might start singing a different song or dancing a different dance. And the females of the regular group are saying, what, are you a dork? Leave me alone. And so they ignore those males. And so they become, they won't mate. They become a little bit isolated from each other. A temporal isolation results in a difference in timing. Temporal means timing. So um, maybe they breed at different times of the day. Maybe they breed at different seasons, different months. Um, maybe they, they one has a courtship song that they have to sing as the sun sets, and the other one only mates with people who sing when the sun is rising. 
I don't know what it is, but it, different timing issues. That's a temporal isolation. Mechanical isolation is when mechanically they just anatomically don't fit anymore. Picture in your mind a Great Dane and a Chihuahua. Okay, in the, at the moment they're going through diversifying selection where they're becoming more and more different because mechanically it just doesn't fit. And no, you're not getting a picture of this, but think about it. Okay, let's move on. That's kind of funny one. Okay, gamete isolation is when the receptors on the sperm head and the egg do not match, and so the per sperm can't enter the egg. Um, another could be that the physical chemistry in the vagina is wrong and is different, and so it kills the sperm. That would be a gamete isolation, where your gametes, which are sperm and egg, are isolated from each other. The next three are post-zygotic barriers. These are things that happen after a sperm and egg have united. Okay, so just by chance they did unite. Now what's going to happen? Well, the first one is a low hybrid zygote viability, which means you do get a hybrid forming, but it fails to develop. Or if it does, if it is born, it does not survive to sexual maturity, so they die prematurely. Okay, so it's it dies before it's an, an adult, if it's even born at all. A lot of stillbirth ones there. Hybrid infertility says, well, it was born and it does survive, but it's sterile, so it can't produce babies. A really good example of this is if you take a horse and you mate it with a donkey, you get a mule, but mule are sterile. They cannot produce babies. The last one is a low hybrid adult viability, in which cases the hybrid is born and they do survive. They do produce babies. They are fertile. However, their babies have low survivorship, and so they don't survive well and usually don't produce offspring. An example is a liger. A liger is from a male lion and a female tiger. Um, they are much larger than a lion, but they don't reproduce. They are fertile, but their babies just don't survive. So here's a, a liger. Very, very large lion-tiger combination. Okay. The next thing we need to discuss is the difference between allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation. Okay, Speciation means the formation of a new species. Allopatric speciation is, it says it's forming because of a geographical barrier that separates them, and so they become more and more isolated from each other. They become more and more genetically different from each other. You have diversifying selection resulting in speciation. Sympatric speciation says, no, 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 you have a small population within the large population. They become more and more genetically different from the large population, but they're still in the same geographic area, and they do become different species. So let's look at allopatric speciation first. Okay, um, It's been widely studied looking at a group of salamanders. Now, what happened with the salamanders, the original population lived up in Oregon. And as the glaciers receded and stuff like that, 10,000 years ago, they started migrating very slowly because they're salamanders. They started migrating south. When they got to the Cascade Mountain Range, which is this white area right here, they separated into two different groups. And as you'll notice, the groups on either side become more and more different from each other and resulting in different species. And so now we have five different species originating from the one Oregon population. Okay, it's a speciation. Geographical speciation. Another example of allopatric speciation you can find looking at island biolo biology. When a new species, let's just go through an example. Okay, here's the mainland. For some reason, species A ends up on this first island. 
Okay, and they are the same. Maybe they're blown over by a hurricane or somehow they end up on the island, separated from the mainland. Well, they're only going to be able to breed with species A. So they breed with each other. Whatever genetic mutations they have, because it's a small population, will become more prevalent quicker than in a large population over here. So their mutations that they have will become, make them more and more different from the main population, ultimately resulting in them becoming a totally different species. So even if you did put them together, A and B would not be able to mate anymore. Well, some of the B move to a different nearby island. On that nearby island, their genetic mutations make them more and more different from the original population, and then some of those will recolonize the first island and colonize nearby islands. Okay, on the first island, the one that was recolonized, or actually, no, the one on the new island is going to, again, genetic mutations are going to make it more and more different, and then it can recolonize these other islands. But these genetic mutations in this one that was a D make it more and more different from the original Ds. And so now you have more and more species evolving from the mainland species. They become, they've gone through speciation. All because they're geographically isolated from each other. Okay, so that's kind of a fun one. Let's look at sympatric speciation. Sympatric speciation means that you're going to require some type of reproductive barrier to isolate certain individuals from the rest of the population. They become reproductively isolated. Okay, it could be things like a switch in habitat, switch in food source, um, rigid preference for specific forms of female. It can be genetic. We'll, I'll go into an example of that. But here let's say we have the original population of trees. Well, some tree became reproductively isolated from the rest of the trees, resulting in a small population of a new type of tree in the middle of the old forest. Now, with, with plants, one of the things that can happen, they can become polyploidy. Poly means many. Chromosome number is ploidy. What will happen, instead of being the 2N, which is the regular pine tree, for some reason, they can survive and become 3N, 4N, and even 8N. But those that have a different chromosome number than the main population are reproductively isolated from the main population and will only be able to breed with themselves, resulting in a new population, a new species in the middle of the old species. That's an example of sympatric speciation. Here's another one where you've got a, a river, okay, which would be an allopatric speciation. Okay, um, like I mentioned, polyploidy, when you get multiple sets of chromosomes. Okay, let's look at the difference between autoploidy and alloploidy and things like that. Okay, polyploidy is the duplication of sets of chromosomes in a single species or combining chromosomes from different species in alloploidy. Okay, very common in plants, very rare in animals. So autoploidy. Let's say um, you've got a gamete where the chromosome number was not reduced to N. Instead, it was a 2N number. Um, when it mates with a, um, an egg, an ovum, that also was not reduced to, two, to N from 2N, you result with a 4N number. Well, that's a tetraploid. Because the chromosome number is very different from the original, it can't, it can't cross-pollinate any of the other trees. And so it can only self-pollinate. And all of this offspring would be genetic clones of the original parent plant. Okay, that's an autoploidy. Okay. Alloploids may be produced when individuals of two closely related species interbreed. But this messes up meiosis and results in chromosomes that can be doubled and all kinds of weird stuff. Um, but because chromosomes pair up with almost identical pair, the offspring tend to be fertile. And the example your textbook talked about was the gray tree frog examples from Chapter 17. And if you don't remember those, you need to go back to Chapter 17 and read about the gray tree frogs. Okay? Punctuated equilibrium. 
This is a phenomenon that is noted in the fossil record, and that's not really understood 100%. But basically what you'll have in the fossil record is you'll have an organism's DNA, you know, no, and apparently no change in the fossil record. They just kind of no change, no change, no change, no change. And then bam, there's a big change, whoops, big change in their, uh, in their characteristics. And then they go along again, no change, no change, no change, bam, a big change in their physical characteristics. And so they call that punctuated equilibrium because it's punctuated by rapid change. Okay, let's look at the difference between macroevolution and microevolution. Microevolution are the infinitely small changes that occur to mutation of the DNA, resulting in allele frequency changes. Macroevolution is simply um, evolution at a species level where you get large changes. Okay, so let's look at an example. Macroevolution, the formation of the eye. How did the eye form? The eye is, your eyeball is one of the most complex organs ever. How in the world did something like that evolve? Okay, so here's some very simple things, and we're going to watch a little video that's going to describe it too. Um, some very primitive worms have some light sensitive cells. Um, on their head region and planaria have those and they have them in a little indentation on their head by having an indentation it allows that little those little light photosensitive cells to have shadows and so they there becomes a, a difference in what each of the cells is sensing and the planaria are, are able then to use that information to sense where organisms or shadows or light are coming from okay they can't focus it they don't have a lens they can't do much more than sense that there is light in that direction but it tells them a directionality the next type of eye to develop was in mollusks and they have that cup shape um, but over time the cup has gotten and there are examples of this in living mollusks where it has become more and more shaped like a, a interior ball and it has gotten sh shaped like a ball with a smaller and smaller opening. By having a smaller opening it helps to focus the light at the back of the the ball, the back of the eye. Well octopus and, and nautilus have very complex eyes. They see better underwater than you see. They have excellent vision and they've actually developed a lens that they use to focus. Now the lens doesn't work like your lens. Instead of how your eye focuses, you stretch the lens and change the shape of the lens. They do it more like a microscope where the lens is in position and then they change the position of it, moving it forward or backwards within the eye to focus the light. So the eye works differently, but it still has very similar character characteristics to your own. Okay, so you have first just the light photosensitive cells, you get a cup shape, you get more of a ball shape with fluid on the inside trying to focus on the back, then you get a, a lens forming, a primitive lens, and then you get a real lens. Okay, so that's kind of the type of eye. So let's watch this little video about the formation of the eye. And I'm sorry I can't enlarge the picture, it's the way it is. At the University of Lund in Sweden, zoologist Dan Erik Nilsson has developed models to show how a primitive eye spot could evolve through intermediate stages to become a complex human-like eye in less than half a million years. Yeah, I've been interested in eye evolution for a long time. I mean, in particular, I've been interested in the question of how long time it would take for an eye to evolve. Nielsen envisioned a sequence of stages by which a flat patch of light-sensitive cells on an animal's skin could evolve into a camera-type eye. As a first step, nature would favor any changes that made the flat patch more cup-like. As soon as you've created even the slightest depression in the center, it means that the, the um, edges of the cup will actually shade light from 
parts of the environment. And of course, all the light sensitive cells in this little cup, they won't measure light in exactly the same direction. So already this cup has some pictorial information. Another model demonstrates what a primitive cup eye can do. The brightly lighted skulls cast an image onto a translucent screen. Nielsen installs at the back of the cup to act like a retina. But the image is not at all well defined. The cup eye can do little more than detect movement. This kind of eye can be found in nature today, in flatworms. Their eyes evolved no further. In their environment, that's all they needed. But if the animals need to move faster or evolve to become fast predators or to see other fast predators, then the construction needs to be improved. And one way of doing that is to constrict the opening and to make it smaller. That's just what happened to creatures like the chambered nautilus. Over thousands of generations, natural selection favored those with slightly more constricted eye openings, which focused light more sharply. This worked well, up to a point. Since this strategy of making a sharp image also has the drawback of creating a very dim image, it's not very popular in the animal kingdom. And uh, there is an alternative solution which is, has become very popular in the animal kingdom, the solution that we use in our own eyes, and that is to put in a lens. Nielsen's model lens uses two thin layers of clear plastic. He can inject water in between them to make the plastic windows bulge out like a convex lens. This mimics what natural selection might have done over a few hundred thousand generations, favoring animals with a rounded, transparent layer in their eyes that cause light to be focused more sharply on the retina. So we can make it gradually from no lens at all and just continue to inject more water, making the lenses bulge more and more and the image becomes gradually sharper and sharper. So we can go all the way gradually in very small steps from a simple uh, pigment cup eye which has barely got the ability to determine the direction of a light source all the way to a complete camera type eye of the same type as we have ourselves. And that is really exactly the way eye evolution must proceed. Kind of interesting how the eye evolved. Okay, we're almost at the end. Um, evolution, like it says on here, has a lot of dead ends. 99.9% .9 of all organisms that have ever evolved have gone extinct. So if we look at an example of a phylogenetic tree, you can see we have the horse horses of today, but all of these other ones have gone extinct. These species are no longer here. 99.99%. .99%. That's a lot of extinctions. Okay, that's it for tonight. Have a wonderful night.